Um, we have uh, a lot of materials at the back, including bios for all the speakers today, and a lot of materials, including the World Bank's flagship report on mobility and the rise of, the Latin, of Latin America's middle class. Um, for those of you who are uh, first time at the center, uh, we are an uh, independent research institution that seeks to impact the policies of the powerful and influential uh, and how those decisions made in rich world capitals impact <coughs> developing countries. Um, uh, we have uh, recently launched a new Latin America initiative uh, led by uh, Liliana Rojas Suarez, who you'll, you'll hear from soon. Um, in the uh, spirit of CGD, uh, this initiative is going to seek uh, collaboration with uh, a lot of our partners that are doing fantastic work on Latin America. Uh, this event is a great example of that collaboration. Um, the topic today, I think everyone here knows, is on the emerging middle class in Latin America. Of course, this is an uh, issue much bigger and much, uh, much more uh, important than just Latin America. Uh, the India, the Indian middle class is uh, an area of, uh, of intense attention. Uh, the African Development Bank has been talking a lot about Africa's emerging middle class. So I think we're still at the front end of a wave of new work on the middle class. Um, this has also been an issue that's a longtime interest of Nancy Birdsell. Uh, she would have loved to be here today. She's still on sabbatical at Williams College, but she will be back in a couple of weeks. Um, Nancy's done some writing on, on Latin America's middle class. We've also had work on defining uh, the middle class by uh, a visiting fellow, Andy Sumner. Uh, also in CGD spirit, we, we don't take institutional positions. We like to have vigorous debate. My colleague, Charles Kenny, who's here, has tried to be very skeptical about all, all of this attention on the middle class. Um, and this, this event today is also part of uh, an ambitious project that, that CGD has jointly with CPLAN. Uh, which has work from uh, Liliana, from Nancy, uh, Amanda Glassman, and uh, visiting fellow Alejandro Foxley, uh, among others, uh, that's looking at the, the long-term uh, development prospects uh, for the Latin American uh, and Caribbean region. Uh, so today's game plan is, uh, is um, uh, uh, actually not, I was going to say it's simple, it's actually not simple. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to have welcoming uh, remarks from, uh, from the Latin America and Caribbean Vice President from the World Bank, uh, Hassan Tuli. Welcome, good to have you here. Uh, then we'll have um, about a 20 minute presentation from the World Bank staff on this flagship publication about the middle class. And then uh, we will we'll conclude with a, a um, uh, a discussion, a panel that Liliana will, will, will host, um, several distinguished speakers, uh, but this will not be presentations. This will be uh, dynamic and interactive, uh, and I, I, uh, I don't think there's PowerPoint, right? Is there PowerPoint? For the Just for the presentation. Okay, good. Uh, the, the goal today is to try to gain a better understanding, including what the World Bank has found, but beyond that, of the region's political and economic prospects. And the challenge, I think, for the group today is not just to analyze these complex and important trends, but also we're here in Washington, let's, let's, and this is CGD's mission, please try to think, give us some suggestions on what is the appropriate role for outsiders, like the World Bank, like CGD, like others, uh, that want to try to encourage progress uh, on the economic and political side. Uh, so with that, let me please uh, introduce and welcome uh, Vice President Tuli. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, um, and thank you very much, um, Todd. Um, and let me first start by thanking CGD um, for hosting this event. And to, to take up this, what we think is a very fundamental question, which is really at the core of this um, new flagship report that the team has put together, economic mobility and the rise of the Latin American middle class. It's a question on how the emergence of a strong middle class in Latin America and the Caribbean is helping shape a more updated social contract in the region. And it's a question that I think we'll ask at the end. Um, so the topic of this year's flagship report, mobility, equity, the middle class, 
they're very dear, as Todd was saying, to the heart of Nancy, um, Nancy Birchall, who, who has done excellent and very influential research um, on this matter. In fact, Nancy um, played a very active role um, in shaping this study, um, both from the inception stages and the drafting stages, uh, through empirical and, uh, and conceptual contributions that she's made. So I know she's not here, but thank you very much, Nancy, for all your support. And in every aspect, um, this has been a very fruitful collaboration that we've had with CGD, and I hope we'll continue that in the future. Now, the topics um, that are covered by this report are really of major importance, not only for the region, but for the World Bank. And I come from Turkey, and this is very much the kind of issue, and we are just talking with Nora about it, many, many countries are debating. And I might say, not only in the emerging world, but even in some of the developed countries. The emergence of a strong middle class provides Latin America region with a whole bunch of new opportunities. The rising middle class can help promote social and economic reforms that lead to sustained and more inclusive property. But, but as the report suggests, the social contract that exists currently in Latin America, that implicit and explicit arrangement between society and the state, is such today that it may prevent the middle class from playing such a catalytic role. I think that's one of the big questions that, um, that, 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 that is flagged. So while the region has shown the world that sound economic policies coupled with social equity is not only possible, but it is indeed desirable, the question is how do we sustain this success? That countries will need to continue on their path of growth and reducing equality, improving the delivery of public services, the effectiveness of public service delivery, putting greater emphasis on equity, and to give the middle class the right incentives, the right signals to contribute more and help shape a more updated, if I may call it, updated social contract. The report also lies at the heart of the World Bank's mission, which is to achieve a prosperous and inclusive development path for our member countries. So while eliminating extreme poverty will still be a challenge, <coughs> Achieving greater inclusion remains one of the central objectives of the mission. Much still needs to be done to give every child, independent of his or her status, family background, and race, equal access to opportunities to prosper. And we hope that our work in Latin American middle-income countries will help show the way to other regions on how to prosper, engage the middle class, and ensure that the so-called middle-income trap is left behind. Um, and I'm confident with the conversations we're having right now with the regional, regional leaders that we're able to adopt, we will be able to adopt the right reforms to seize on these opportunities, to broaden the middle class, and to avoid this middle-income trap, um, and to ensure that, that the track record of growth with um, social inclusion will be sustained and deepened. I don't want to take um, a lot of time from the discussion and the presentations which will follow shortly, but, um, and I, I'll be very interested in hearing the, the presenters um, and the discussants view on it. Um, Augusto de la Torre, our chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean, and, and Hamele Rigolini, one of our main authors of the report, will present um, the main findings. And um, I'm very delighted to have um, um, Nora Lustig here, um, and we're talking about all sorts of other angles of collaboration here along these types of issues. Um, and we have Kaushik Basu. Um, Dr. Basu is our new chief economist for the World Bank Group. And uh, we're delighted to have you here as one of the, di one of the discussants. I just found out, um, I just learned that unfortunately Santiago Levy, my friend, is not well. So he's unable to join us. Um, but we'll be thinking of him, and we hope he gets better very soon. Um, they're surely going to be very interesting and provocative comments. Uh, and um, so, Liliana, thank you very much for, for everything. Um, I look forward to the comments and the conversations here. Thank you all very much. OK. Uh, we have thanked uh, the CGD not enough, so let me add my own thanks for putting this event together. Um, I want to start by saying this, as every report, 
is a is a collective action uh, effort and is a large team before be, be behind that i i think i'm very fortunate to have one of the main authors with me he will explain every difficult point uh, uh, later on yamele uh, rigolini but the other authors including chico ferreira and julian messina from my office are uh, in other countries also discussing this report uh, i think we also have mariana lugo another member of the team and an important uh, author in this report. So let me, let me get quickly to the, to the main points because we have 20 minutes. Uh, let me see how this works. First of all, why the report? Uh, it's, it's, for me, the main motivation is this. The graph on the top has been uh, documented every place, and perhaps the World Bank was very influential in, in showing that for the first time in many, many years, Latin America experienced a significant reduction in poverty. More than 70 million Latin Americans left the poverty ranks since 2003. That's a remarkable number. The graph on the right comes from Nora. <laughs> Nora is perhaps the most influential researcher that has put on the map the history of changes in the distribution of income in Latin America and has highlighted a very surprising fact, the reduction in income inequality in Latin America during the last decade, even as income inequality is rising everywhere else. So this, of course, raises questions such as who moved up out of poverty, who stayed behind, how much vulnerability remains in terms of risk of falling back into poverty, how important is family background in determining uh, success in life, and therefore this sort of equality of opportunity agenda. If there's really a new middle class, which we claim there is, how does it look? How does it walk? How does it think? How does it act? And is the middle class helping, in one way or another, improve the quality of government, of institutions, and of public services? So this is how we started, with these questions. Now, don't think we answer all these questions very well. <laughs> these questions are going to be with us for many, many years. So we are just starting to scratch the surface behind these questions. In order to wrap our hands around that, we had to make big decisions about concepts and measurement. As you know, mobility means different things to different people, and even to very reasonable people, it means very different things. What's, what is it that is moving? And what type of movement do we want to capture? And so does the middle class. The concept of the middle class is a concept that is at the heart of social scientists all over. Economists like to see the economic angle. Sociologists and political science prefer to see occupation, education, uh, asset ownership, etc. So we, th we had to take some choices. I think the three most fundamental choices we took is we decided to use two concepts of mobility. One, mobili one concept of mobility which is more short term, focuses on mo mobility within a generation, and that um, puts an emphasis on income growth for individuals and family. How, what are the dynamics of income growth that help individuals and family uh, increase their standard of living and therefore move from one social strata to another? And the second concept of mobility is what we call intergenerational mobility, which is more related to the concept of origin independence. How much your birthplace, which is something that you do not control, governs your future? In other words, how equalized are opportunities that people face at birth? Does it really matter that you are born in a poor family versus a rich family in terms of your success in life? For the second concept, we use a lot data on education because we don't have in Latin America, as you all know, the panel data that you need to, to study this across time. So those are the two important definitions about mobility and about the middle class. Well, we struggled a lot about that, but after all, we're economists have to play to our strengths. And so we took more of an economic definition of middle class with a little bit of a twist. And so we defined the middle class as a group of people that are not rich, but that are economically secure. So you have to operationalize what, what in the world do we mean by economically secure, and we meant by that people who have incomes such that, that the probability of falling into poverty is relatively low. So the team studied the uh, probabilities of falling into poverty based on historical data, which may not necessarily reflect the future, but that's how it was in the past. 
And when you see these countries, what you see is that if you put a threshold at 10%, if the probability that you want to use is 10%, no more than 10% of falling into poverty, that tends to point to $10 per day per person. That was interesting. Then the team looked at uh, surveys, particularly the eco-social survey from CIEPLAN, where people tell what they think their social status is. Here's the case of Mexico, and, and, and the, the self-perception of whether you're middle class or, or lower income class, uh, especially where the two curves intersect, is what we thought this could be a good point to decide where people perceive as being in the middle class. And that also gave us $10 a day per person. Uh, I promise that they did not fudge the date on this. It was, it was <laughs> an alignment of the stars. So we thought $10 makes sense. And it makes sense to me. You know why? Because if you think of a family of four, the middle class would start with an income of about fourteen dollars to $15,000 per year. That makes kind of sense. And uh, the rich people, well, you can put the threshold any place. They put it at $50 per person per day. I'd like to put it at 100 but anyhow, it's still the, fra the, the population that's above 50 or or $100 per day per person is very small. It's 1% of the population at most, or maybe 2%. So that's the definition. Middle class is the group of individuals and households whose income on a per capita basis exceeds $10 a day per person. So that gives us four classes. And these are the four classes. First, the poor which for Latin America we defined are those who live with less than $4 a day. Then what we call the vulnerable. Yesterday we discussed, we presented the report in Brazil, and, and Brazil uses a different language. They call it the lower middle class. We call it the vulnerable because of our concept of probability of falling into poverty. That's a narrow range of incomes from 4 to $10 a day, but that's, however, the most numerous, the most frequently found uh, uh, observation in our sample. It's the mode of the distribution, the vulnerable. And then you have the middle class from 10 to 50 and the upper class above. Main results, I'm going to talk about the in, intragenerational results and then Yamela will take over the rest of the presentation. I will wrap up with some thoughts about the policy implications. So intragenerational mobility. I would ask you to look at the two circles. For me, they are amazing. This is what I didn't expect. So it's wonderful when you do research and things come out completely different than what you expected. These are lower bounds of mobility, according to the, the, the method the, the team used. So of those that were poor in 1995, which was about more than 45% of the Latin American population, of those that were poor in, 19, in, in 1995, 46% moved up to the vulnerable group. Of those that were vulnerable in 1995, about 33% of the total Latin American population, more than 50% moved up into the middle class. And you see in the matrix, in the numbers below the diagonal, the numbers are relatively small. There was almost no downward movement. So what surprised me was the wave of upward mobility that uh, Latin American experience that we haven't seen, at least I, I didn't see it until this last decade in my professional life. Great deal of uh, intragenerational mobility. Now, of course, it's heterogeneous across the region. Here you have a longer period, I think in this case, the team used early 1990s to the present. And this is the populations of the region divided by who climbed up, who, is, who went down, and who stayed. And uh, the upward mobility is, is uh, denoted by the yellow component of these bars. And what you see is you have had different degrees of intergenerational mobility across the region. You have a country like Chile, more than 60% of the population moved up. In a country like Guatemala, less than 10% of the population moved up. So very different degrees of, of mobility are hidden behind the regional average. Of course, when you try to find out the correlates of what is behind the movement, we find uh, that uh, what 
what helped people move out of poverty is not necessarily the same of what helped people move into the middle class. What helped people move into the middle class was mainly growth, more than redistribution. What helped, peop what helped people move out of poverty was growth, but in distribution play a much more important role. And when you look at correlates, a very good predictor of uh, social mobility in an intragenerational sense is education. And this links very nice to what Yamele will now present. Thank you, Augusto. I think now we move towards the mixed news. Uh, I think the, the most important finding about intergenerational mobility, which means how much do you differ in the rank of the income distribution from your parents, uh, the picture is a little less rosy. What, what we observe in Latin America basically is it's a continent that grew, but where your rank stayed more or less the same. Here what we have, and Mariana worked a lot on, on these uh, mobility matrices across generations, is, is how much the socioeconomic background of your parents matters for educational attainments. And despite the fact that in the region, education, years of education went up, what do you see is that within the gap, the possible gap of education, the background of the parents still matters. And it's not only about attainments. I think this is a much more interesting picture. It's also about achievements. Uh, luckily, in 2009, uh, the PISA uh, uh, service were extended to the region. And what we see is that Latin America suffers from two flows. The first one is that on average, which is the y-axis, Latin American countries in terms of uh, test score performance perform below average. But the problem for the poor in Latin America, it's actually much exacerbated because Latin American countries also perform below average in terms of the mobility uh, and in terms of how much the parents' background matters for your educational attainments. So the region is still in an equilibrium where uh, if you come from an unfavored background, you do perform much worse in school. And that's really among, and they, the Latin American countries are, are really among the worst performing uh, among the PISA study. Now, things luckily are improving. Uh, we don't have two waves of PISA data, but we have waves on how much uh, the parents' background matters for the educational gap, which means how much the difference between the years of education you should have and the one you have. And you see that the parent gap backgrounds starts mattering less and less. And uh, factual evidence or, uh, also suggests that uh, strong efforts have be, are being put to uh, influence and improve the quality of education of the poor. So we are on the right track, but still it is a very immobile society. So most of the mobility within a generation, we saw most of this class transition were done within an income distribution that moves the same for everybody. And uh, here is uh, another kind of suggestive graph in terms of how immobile within generation uh, the, the region is. What we have here is the impact of parental background on children test school with and without school effects. Now when you see it, is with, without school effect, Latin America is among uh, the more immobile societies. When you put school effects, actually Latin America, the immobility of Latin America drops, which means what we see here, it's very difficult to in interpret school effects, but there are two main factors affecting them. It's the quality of the school, the differential quality of the school that where the poor and the rich go, but also the sorting across schools. So it is still a very fragmented society where the rich go to better school and they all go together so the peer effects are, uh, are great and the poor go to worse school, they go together so they don't benefit from uh, positive spillovers. And we're going to see that picture is going to be reflected in the social contract of Latin America which we are going to speak uh, later on. Now, <clears throat> despite this immobile society, the region benefited a lot about growth and I think we need to recognize the uh, really amazing efforts the countries did to improve the conditions of the poor and, and also to trickle down a bit of, of, of the commodity bonanza they benefited uh, towards the poor. And all that led to, I think, an amazing performance in the number of people in the middle class who, as Augusto said, are people who do not seem to be that much vulnerable to poverty anymore. 
And what you can see is we did observe until 2003 more or less of a lost decade where poverty and middle class numbers didn't uh, move that much. But from 2003 onwards, we observed a dramatic decrease in poverty and a dramatic increase in the middle class. And uh, in 2009, for the first time, there were as many people in the middle class as in poverty. Now, that, that, does that mean that Latin America is, yet, is already a middle class society? We don't think so. We think it's a middle income region moving towards being a middle class society. Why? Because if you look, two thirds of the people are still either poor or vulnerable to poverty. So I think we are heading towards the right direction. It's, uh, it has been a great dec decade for the region, but uh, much remains to do. And part of <coughs> the picture we observe is also strong heterogeneity across countries. In Uruguay and Argentina, I think we can confidently say these are middle class societies. But when you move towards Central America and some countries uh, in uh, uh, a bit below south, such as El Salvador, Bolivia, and Honduras, these are still, uh, I would call it, not, not, not middle class societies. So it's, it's a bit difficult to uh, make uh, a, single, a single statement for the whole region. And one other, but there are some striking facts uh, that, and regularities that we observed in doing the report. Uh, one is that for the middle class, Growth in average income matters much more than uh, redistribution. And the other one, I'm, I'm, how, much, how much time do you have? Just. OK, it's going to be fine. We're going to accelerate a little. Uh, the, the other one is that the, the Growth of the middle class is not uh, necessarily only a Latin American phenomenon. It happened everywhere in the emerging world. Here we have the growth of the middle class in the BRIC, and you see that since the year 2000, uh, it re the middle class really grew everywhere. Now, in, in China, you have 80 million people in the middle class in 2008, now probably many more, but you can see it's still only about 10% of the population. So when we do growth middle class growth forecast, we really see that in the future, China is going to be where the middle class is going to explode. India, not, not, uh, we're, we're not there yet, uh, but uh, slowly it's also picking up. Ooh, and another regularity we find is that the profile, and that's actually something that Nancy Burstall uh, found first, and, and we, we own a much uh, from her uh, to her. The profile of the middle class is surprisingly similar across countries, uh, which you know you can say yes, they all earn between ten and fifty dollars a day, but still. Uh, uh, so even if we correct for income, we find that all over Latin America, middle class more or less have between ten and eleven years of education, much more than the vulnerable. They live in urban areas. They have smaller family size. And also, they don't rely excessively on the state. There used to be that view that the middle class was excessively con uh, constituted of public employees. We find that 20%, no more, are public employees. So these are really, uh, the middle class really benefit from wage employment. So the, 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 the way we conclude the report is asking ourselves, what does that impressive growth of the middle class imply for the social contract in the region? And there, I think we see opportunities, but also challenges. Uh, all over the world, there is a big fuzz, uh, much rumor stating that uh, middle class is good for change, brings reforms. But there are very few empirical analyses, most of them strongly related to inequality, but not our absolute concepts of the middle class. So the first thing we did we build, we, is to build a cross-country data set containing information on the middle class to see if it was true that an increase in the middle class is associated with uh, change. And what we found was pretty striking. I mean, these are cross-country cross -country regressions, but uh, so they need to be taken with, with some caveats. But still, we find that even after correcting for GDP, an increase in the middle class is associated with public increase in public health expenditure, more public education expenditure, more credit market liberalization, and more democracy and less corruption. So we do find an association between an increase in the middle class and, uh, and uh, positive change. But does it hold for Latin America? And that's where I think the debate is open. Uh, 
one avenue through which people see the change is through the middle class having special values that really promote change. And at least for Latin America, we, don't, we do not find that. What we did using Ecosocial Survey, we correlate uh, values such as perceptions of opportunity and trust in an institution with individual characteristics. And what we see is that middle uh, values are very much country but not class specific. A middle class individual in Brazil is much closer to a poor individual in Brazil than to a middle class individual in, let's say, Ecuador. So we, we do not see the middle class necessarily playing that role of catalytic age, agent for change in the region. And that is reflected a little in the fragmented social contract that we observe in the region. The left graph by Nora uh, shows that everybody benefits a little from pieces of the social contract. For instance, the poor, thanks to the amazing increase in social expenditures, now does benefit more than any other classes from social spending. At the same time, the middle class benefits disproportionately from tertiary education. So you have, you, the, the region is trapped, many countries in the region are trapped in a social contract where people benefit a bit from different pieces of, of, uh, uh, of what the state provides, but it's not necessarily very inclusive. Moreover, the middle class in many countries is opting out from very important services. The middle class disproportionately seeks private education. Why? Because the quality of public education is poor, and that's what we saw before. The middle class excessively seeks private security. In the Dominican Republic, they even excessively seek their own electricity. Why? Because shortages are poor, uh, are excessive. So what, what we fear is that many countries are trapped in a bad equilibrium of low taxation leading to... Uh, leading to poor provision of public services, which in turn leads to the middle class to opt out and not wanting to pay more higher taxes because they don't see the return from paying higher taxes. So what, what we conclude the report, and I think Augusto is going to now speak, is, is ways we can break that poor equilibrium and try to bring uh, the country into a better equilibrium of and more inclusive in equilibrium where everybody contributes but also benefits uniformly from uh, what the state provides. Thank you. Okay, Liliana, I promise to take one minute to just conclude. Uh, so these are the main conclusions. Within generations, econ economic growth and employment have lifted most incomes, including of the poor, and have generated significant social progress. Across generations, who your parents are, still is too important a determinant of, of own achievements. The educational system, in particular in Latin America, is not yet providing the equalization of opportunity roles that one would expect. The middle class is growing, but still two-thirds of Latin Americans are either poor or vulnerable. And there seems to be a worrisome pattern in the region where the middle classes tend to opt, up, opt out of the social contract, opt out of public services in particular. What does this suggest for policy areas? We mentioned three big ones, and we did not analyze them in great detail. One, I think there is a need to incorporate equality of opportunities explicitly into social policy, not as an afterthought. Uh, and this, perhaps, nowhere more important than in the quality of education, including not just primary, secondary, but tertiary. Policy area number two, I think the region needs to revisit a social protection system. The social protection system has many components. We have done a lot of progress in the social assistance component of social protection, particularly the conditional cash transfers targeted to the poor. We need to calibrate the system to pay attention to the, uh, to the new so social structure where the vulnerable are important in the largest group. We need to integrate better the social protection system in terms of its social assistance component with a social insurance component. That is health, that's pensions, that's unemployment. Third area, when well, that's the toughest. Yesterday, I, they gave several interviews on this launch of this report, and the question that most often came is, how do you break out of this bad equilibrium of middle classes opting out of public services? And I really do not know. But we do say one thing in the report. We say that this type of traps have to be broken somewhere. And it is the first time that the region may have the wherewithal to break it. The region has had a lot of new revenues 
without taxing people. They have come from commodities. So it creates an amazingly unique opportunity to use those revenues to improve in a quantum leap the quality of public services, which could be the beginning of engaging the middle class into participating as citizens in the building of better institutions, demanding better institutions, and also be willing to pay for them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Augusto and Jamil. Uh, now we move to the uh, next part of the program, um, which is a discussion with my two very distinguished guests, um, <coughs> um, Kaushuk Basu, who uh, well has already been introduced, but uh, welcome to CGD. It's the first time of what I hope will be many more, uh, new chief economist at the World Bank. And uh, Nora Lustig, who is uh, a Tulane uh, professor, uh, but most importantly, non resident fellow at CGD. Um, so, the way we're going to conduct this conversation is I'm going to uh, start a discussion, a questions and answer um, a period with the panelists. And I ask both of them to be sharp and brief. And we are allowed to interrupt. <laughs> okay? You can interrupt can each other, no problem. And I will too, sure. <laughs> All right, so um, let me start with a question to you, um, Kashik. You know, in, when we saw the World, read the World Bank report, but uh, by the way, congratulations, Augusto and team, it was an excellent report. Uh, they characterized the typical Latin America middle class. The worker, a typical worker, basically is reasonably educated works in the formal sector and in urban areas. And there's a high probability that is typically employed uh, in the service sector and by a private enterprise. Now, you bring a fresh perspective from outside Latin America. Do you think that this typification is common to other developing countries? Is it typical to Latin America? You think, oh, you have heard this many times before, and especially for the case of India, where you have most experience. Um, could you make a comparison so that we can put Latin America in context in the world, please? Liliana, thank you very much. Uh, if I may begin by violating very briefly your sharp and brief restriction on us by just thanking you all. Uh, uh, CGD uh, and uh, the Latin America group, I wanted to do that because for me, this is a very nostalgic um, uh, occasion. I first got interested in this topic, curiously enough. It was sitting in on Nancy Birdsall's work that got me interested. Also, I've got friends here I was looking forward to meeting, Nora, from years ago. Um, uh, I was actually, well, not that long ago. Yeah, let's stress, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Uh, I was actually uh, really uh, keen on meeting Santiago Levy because with him, my last round was, when we went in southern Mexico to a troubled region to spend three days with Zapotec families. I had calculated there's a 5% probability I'll never come back from that experience. <laughs> but it didn't go that way. I came back. So it was a wonderful visit. And it's just great, Liliana, for giving me the opportunity to reconnect. And now I'll follow your strictures. Please. <laughs> um, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of work. Actually, uh, the little bit that I've read and heard, it's just totally absorbing. And I feel actually, uh, in terms of relating it to other countries and other regions, I think it's extremely important. Yes, the categories, in some ways, there is a context where you may have to chop and cut a little bit. India is an extremely poor country. So uh, you would get by this particular, literally by this uh, cutoff, a uh, very small middle class. And then it begins to pick up, as you saw in that very nice uh, graph, which was there. But there is one social and political side to the middle class, which I think actually is coming out over here, that you know, middle class contributes to democracy in a very big way. Middle class, class also contributes in another way. It's a bulwark against crony capitalism, because it's the super rich who are very close to the government. 
and the super rich being very few in numbers, it is very easy for them to become a part of the governance process. The very poor are too far away to contest this. It's the middle class that gets a bit envious of this close clubbing of the super rich with the government. And this is one case of envy, which is a very big contributor to social participation, to democracy, all the things that you are seeing there. And this is where India relates in a somewhat interesting way. It's a poorer country. From 1994, India's growth rate has picked up. The growth rate has picked up phenomenally, but from a very low base. So the middle class is coming in in smaller numbers. If you take the $4 uh, uh, to, to uh, $10 plus uh, 4 to 10 category, uh, the re just above the vulnerable, if you take that, it's smaller. But in terms of social participation, it has been very big, luckily. And that's the social side of it, the political side of it, the early founding fathers pushing in for that has contributed. And that part was there. On the organized sector and services, I will just make one remark and then stop. Because India's growth from 1994 was driven by the services sector. Uh, India was the fastest growing services sector for 15 years. It got overtaken by China after that, but very fast. So that part does look very similar, that it is the services sector that contributes to it. But there's one more thing which is <coughs> slightly unusual in India. India, the organized manufacturing sector is very small. And those who are there in the organized manufacturing sector, even as laborers, are virtually the middle class because the unorganized sector is the vast underclass, the vulnerable and the poor. So the organized sector matters. And there, I have to say, in terms of numbers, the government tends to dominate still the government employee, which is a bit different. These are interesting differences for me, but the attention and the care that has gone into this study is exemplary because it has huge implications, I feel, for good political ends. Thank you. Um, your answer made me to change the order of the questions. I was going to turn to a specific question for you, but instead I'm going to um, raise another issue. I'm a little bit more skeptical about this power of the middle class to influence changes. And the reason is because of a topic that I did not see too much discussed in the report, but that I see everywhere when we talk about Latin America, and is the quality of institutions. Um, one, when I read the report, what raised my attention significantly is that the fact that both the poor and the middle class have the same aspirations. And I thought, OK, what is common to the middle class and the poor? They face the same institutions. So you know, to me, that's a central topic, OK? Maybe. Maybe it's not that it's going to be the middle class or the poor who is actually going to be the force for change, but they're not going to be incentive for any change if the institutions don't change. Because both the poor and the middle class, why would they want to go farther, to move farther, to do something different if they are going to be constrained by bad rules of law, by bad uh, enforcement of contracts? OK? So and this is a question for both of you. And I'll start with, with your answer. You see. Reforming institutions is the most difficult of all reforms, especially the judiciary system, because it's the power of a state, and powers don't reform themselves. So we can go over and over having more discoveries about how the system works, but as long as we don't improve institutions, I don't see us moving anywhere. <coughs> so the question for both of you, and I'll start with Nora, is how can we generate incentives for the middle class, or for the poor, or for the one sandwich in between, to actually change institutions, be a motor of change for institutions. OK, so let me also start by thanking uh, Lilian and CGD for uh, the invitation. This is the second time I have the pleasure and the honor to comment mm -hmm. on the report in the lapse of, I think, 10 days. The first one was in last. It will not be the last. It will not be the last. <laughs> this is it. But I was allowed to use PowerPoint last time, not this time. And you know, the question that you posed, let me start by saying that I feel a little humbled uh, about answering a question like the one you posed. I think that we economists now are beginning to be a little bit uh, overstretching ourselves into realms in which other social scientists have more uh, <laughs> expertise. 
And I would uh, invite us <laughs> economists to be a little bit more humble also in terms of how much can we say about certain things. So I may not be able to address exactly your question. I don't know. It's not my area. And uh, when I came to Washington many years ago, I don't live here anymore, but whenever someone asked me a question, I said, if I didn't know the answer, I said, that's not my area of expertise, which is not traditional in DC, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I sort of followed that. First, you know, I think that uh, I wanted to make a comment regarding the taxonomy because when we're talking about these groups, if we don't agree on what the groups are, we're going to be uh, not being very rigorous about this. So I think uh, I like the taxonomy that you have used, and I think we can call maybe the 10 to 50 the established middle class, and the other one, you know, so you don't get into quarrels with your Brazilian uh, authors, uh, the, the, it's more like the lower middle class, the unestablished, the vulnerable. Nancy Birdsell is calling them the catalytic class right. now. And we're writing a paper on this with Andy Sumner and Nancy for the, for the other project. I have a doubt about whether we can have a coalition between the poor and the vulnerable on the one side and the established middle class on the other. If you th look at where the median voter is in Latin America <coughs> at present, in most countries with a very primitive measure. In most countries, it is in the vulnerable group, the four to 10, the lower middle class. Uh, it's not in the high middle class. And I think that uh, we see many, many cases, maybe not, but we see enough cases in Latin America in which we have to accept that populist redistributive policies are a good substitute for accountable and democratic institutions. And that uh, the majority of the population supports more the former than the latter. Otherwise, we would not see a recurrent election of governments that are weakening the institutions, okay? And maybe, uh, you know, to, uh, to undo that majority will be difficult mm -hmm. because when you look at uh, the time that will have to elapse to actually for if there is such a thing as the established middle class values, as you seem to indicate, will take quite a bit of time. <coughs> Even in countries that are defined as primarily middle class as Argentina. So I think we have to be cautious about what to expect, uh, ex about you know automatic correlations. And again, here is where I invite people who are in other areas, <laughs> like Joan Nelson, to, to chip in uh, uh, later. Uh, I also think that you can have a lot of social mobility and economic mobility with very rotten institutions. In the world, we have many examples of that. So let's not assume that one will be a necessary condition for the other. I'm not, not even sure whether it's a necessary outcome, you know, when you have social mobility that you will eventually have good institutions. I, I think we have to be more cautious about that. So uh, I, uh, this is, let me stop here, but this is, you know, what I want to say. Okay. Um, um, before going, moving to you, Koshik, um, taking from what Nora said, which um, I agree largely, I still have this concern that you are never going to get equality of opportunities if you don't have the right institutions. And I am, I'm sorry I'm insisting so much on that, but a few years ago, uh, we put up together a book that is called uh, Growing Pains in Latin America, where Augusto was actually part of the task force. And we identified this equality of opportunity as a major constraint for growth in Latin America. And it, does, it seems to be coming up and coming up and coming up as something that we did really have to work on or think how to work on, or maybe recognize that, well, we are not the right profession to be dealing with the, with the topic. Um, but anyway, having said that, uh, Koshik, please. Liliana, thank you very much. It, uh, like Nora said, um, the strict uh, response to that is it takes me so much outside my field that I don't know. But nevertheless, I will give an answer. So of course. Uh, <laughs> you do that. You have to. <laughs> it's, it's an extremely important question uh, about institutions. And I feel institutions are critical. Uh, economists uh, uh, give too little importance uh, to the power of institutions, political institutions, social institutions. Having said that, 
And maybe this is a disagreement, Liliana, and, and I'm glad that your, your institute was described as one which does not take up institutional positions. I love that. So um, my view is that it's a two-way process between the development of institutions and actually the emergence of the middle class. Yes, institutions are extremely important, but where do institutions come from in the end? It is people like you talking about it, people like me talking about it. If that, that segment of the population is lacking, that early conversation, the pressure for good institutions don't build up. And I'm going to give you one concrete example. Uh, corruption is big news in India now. It's hitting the newspapers every day. We don't know whether corruption has gone up or down in India. We know it is high, but we know that there is a sudden civil society waking up on this matter that has taken place. And for the first time, there is a lot of expectation that mm -hmm. institutions around the management of mm -hmm. uh, corruption will change. Mm -hmm. And the change is probably coming from this rise in this category of people who have a voice. And here, the one distinction with the very poor, and there's a lot of research now, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, the MIT group have been doing, that when you're very poor, and this is a tragic comment, that your cognitive powers begin to suffer. And so a lot of the things that are in your interest, you are not in a position to fight for those because it is affecting your cognitive skills. The middle class is luckily in a category where uh, you, you have your cognitive skills, you are seeing the wrongs in society, so institutions are extremely important, but I feel like you were talking of traps in the end in your report, which I quite like the notion of a trap that there is also a trap element because the institutions lack because there isn't enough of a middle class. And I think the middle class could spearhead the movement of in the development of institutions which will help society. And one more example from the Latin American region. Sitting in India when I was doing my advisory work, actually I hadn't seen this graph of um, uh, inequality going down and the middle class was moving up, but we knew it was happening. And we were trying to get information. Brazil, because of our BRICS connection, we were trying to get a lot of information on Brazil, what is happening in that mm -hmm. society. We'll never get final answers to these things. But I think the report, again, by pointing to the traps, the middle class's social role, political role, is pointing to something that causes these improvements. You don't know where the first movement comes from in a, when you're in a trap. But once the movement becomes begins, you get a snowballing effect. And probably that is what is happening in Latin America. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, um, you um, mentioned um, something that the report has uh, stressed too, and that uh, they acknowledge Nora as an expert uh, on this, and actually the one who has uh, made the beginning statement that is the decrease in inequality. So, Nora, what I would like to ask you is uh, what kind of policies do you see of having the highest priorities? for continue the process of reducing inequality and reducing poverty at the same time, which as you have pointed out many times are not necessary, they don't necessarily go together. Um, do we have examples um, of any country, and it doesn't have to be Latin America, but any country that actually have been able to continue on this path and, go, and get where we want to? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Liliana. The and this is your area of expertise. Yes. <laughs> this, this is, I feel, more at home, although I always, uh, I'm always i always cautious about being general about answers. Yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, where there are some areas in which we can be sure that there will be win-wins. And I think uh, one for me is increasing the access of education in the post-secondary and post-primary, depending on the country, is uh, actually something very important. Because one of the uh, things that are still happening, in the, is still happening in the region is that we have a phenomenon that even though the inequality <coughs> of education has been falling because of the characteristics of the wage distribution, this is still unequalizing. This is something that Francois and Chico, we mm -hmm. used to call it the paradox of progress. And that is a purely Kuznetsian process, forgive me for those who mm. <laughs> are outside this realm, but that it's almost an arithmetic process. So the more you get educational upgrading, you're going to begin to capitalize that even if nothing else happens. So you will have a trend of declining inequality as a result of the educational upgrading. So that's quantity. The next thing is quality, because 
you may be expanding access, but what we know is the tremendous differences in quality. So maybe one policy recommendation, one area to undo and, and the politics of that, maybe Joan can tell us how, but to undo the Gordian knot is to work on improving the quality of education at all levels. And that may help also generate the adequate social contract because what we see in, in Latin America is that the middle class opts out maybe of the pre-tertiary levels of education, but it comes back in the tertiary yeah. level. Actually, in the tertiary level, it gets its fair share. Before that, it goes more to private schooling. So if you bring it back through higher quality of education, you may generate a new type of social compact that could be more sustainable and help the reduction of inequality as well. This third thing, I think, is that we learned that the use of targeted <coughs> programs that include conditions so that the demand for education and health for the children of the poor is observed has been quite important. I don't know whether that will translate into intergenerational mobility in the future, but I do want to generate at least mm -hmm. an equality of opportunity through that process. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that parents are bad agents for their children. Not always, but it happens more often than we think. So the targeted programs are very important. The fourth thing is one of the main causes of big jumps in poverty, both systemically and idiosyncratically, are adverse shocks. So adverse shocks that when they're idiosyncratic is ill health, unemployment, death in the family, and systemic or economic crisis, natural disasters, rising food prices. The region has been doing better, but it's still not there yet. Uh, if you have ways in which you can cushion the impact of uh, adverse shocks so that the vulnerable do not become poor and people who are just made it to the middle class don't become vulnerable to poverty, then that would be a, an important contribution to make this sustainable. And finally, something that we always kind of skirt around in, in Latin America, but we know we have a lot to do, is making the tax system more progressive. And that has not only to do with income tax, it has to do with taxing wealth and assets. Latin America is way behind in terms of property, capital gains, and inheritance, and I think that would be an area where a lot of work needs to be done. Um, Koshik, there's a lot of topics being uh, mentioned by Nora. I know there is, um, this could be an unfair question because you are new to the World Bank, but you don't have to focus your answer on Latin America only, but you know, on, on BRICS and emerging markets in general. But what do you think the World Bank should be doing to support this growth of the middle class, reduction of inequality? I know that the obvious answer is, you know, there are so many programs going on, and yes, we support the teams, and yes, we should empower the countries and all that. We know that. But you're new in the job. So can you share with us what are your thoughts? Sure. Uh, you know, even when I was um, uh, about to move, uh, <laughs> one of the um, things that I had talked about with people at the World Bank um, the World Bank's target population is the poor. That's the World Bank's charter. That's what yeah. the World Bank um, goes after, and that's rightly so. But there are, at times, to get to a particular end, you need means which can be elsewhere. And that's the reason why there is an intellectual discipline, uh, economics, politics, sociology, because life is not everything that meets the eye. I mean, it would have been lovely, and uh, in fact, there wouldn't be so many problems if it was that. And there I feel um, not just the middle class, the middle class, the middle income countries. Okay. As you can't uh, uh, keep them out of focus altogether saying that my focus is the poor. In fact, to get to the poor, you at times have to pay attention to this. And that is what bringing me back to what I was saying earlier is that to target the poorest segments of a population, and that should be the target, no two ways. I mean, when there are people suffering from extreme poverty, I mean, you're not looking after the middle class just because uh, that's an end in itself. But if the middle class can be an instrument to getting at that, and I think it's a very big instrument. It creates, and this is relating back to what you were saying to me again, it's you need the right institutions. Education and institutions are the two most important drivers, I think, 
of a better society for the eradication. And Nora, I want to, I'm glad you brought in progressive taxes. Mm -hmm. I think this, that has to be kept in mind, that progressive taxes play a, a role. It cannot be uh, pushed aside. Now, um, of this agenda, the World Bank's target remains what the World Bank's target is. But I feel we need to uh, uh, pay attention to the middle class and the middle income countries, including, I feel, in Europe. When the couple of countries at the bottom end of the Eurozone are suffering, and there, there are people who are actually poor uh, in those countries, and there is a risk of that problem getting exacerbated, the World Bank ought to pay a lot of attention to that, and not because we are changing our target, but because for those targets, you need to pay attention to these uh, categories. OK. Before asking um, for questions from the public, which I'm sure you have many, I'd like to ask the panel one more question. And is that being a macroeconomist, you know, I'm always skeptic about sustainability of things. You know, the growth of the middle class has occurred since 2003. Those were the good times in the world. So there have been so many pull factors that have helped all the indicators, not only for Latin America, but for many other BRICS and emerging markets, uh, you know. So my question is a question of sustainability. You see, the, the, any forecast that you see now basically predicts that the world, in terms of economic growth, is going to be a flat world, right? So that requires, basically, for the um, growth in, in Latin America and other emerging market economies, that more kind of push factors, meaning the domestic engines of growth from the economies, be present to actually continue the process of change. I'm not certain whether they are there. So this is the question to <coughs> both of you. How do you see the sustainability of what the World Bank report has been indicated is? Who wants to start? You choose. Like, you? you like to <laughs> OK. Uh, let, me, uh, y uh, let me say something regarding the statement that Augusto and Jamele made that it was the growth of the middle class and the vulnerable was primarily growth driven. I think in two countries, uh, and two of the most populous countries in the region, probably not so much, which is Brazil and Mexico. I think redistribution was very important in both. Growth in both countries in the, uh, you know, so if you take an average of the last 10 years without the uptick of Brazil in, in 2008, uh, was between two and 3%, mm -hmm. very mediocre in per capita terms. And still, the middle class grew. Marcelo Neri just finished this, well, last year, this big book on middle class in, in, in Brazil. And he finds that redistribution was very important in generating this momentum of a growing middle class, which in his case, it includes the vulnerable group. I think that, uh, so as much as growth is important, the momentum in inequality not increasing and even continuing to, continuing to fall may be very important for what may happen to the sustainability of this new middle class and growing vulnerable groups. Uh, and I think that, as I said, if you continue with educational upgrading, which seems to be having a momentum, we're probably going to continue to see for some time bearing countervailing forces, at least not an increase in inequality, the mm -hmm. sustainability. So I think that this, this shape may be here to stay for some time unless you have a retrenchment. Mm -hmm. What I see, and you said that, is that the macro conditions augur flatness, but I don't see it augurs uh, big crisis and retrenchment. If we Unless avoid, Europe defaults. Right, but apparently it won't, it won't <laughs> right? <laughs> Teresa, will it default? <laughs> oh, she doesn't know. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> if, there, if there is no big retrenchment, big recession at the world scale, I would say that this makeup, this composition, is durable Please. in Latin America. Yeah. Uh, to the question, is it sustainable, uh, the pithiest answer, and then I want to elaborate a little bit, is that it's very, very likely that it's sustainable, but not necessary. Let me first go to the not necessary. 
the landscape of economic development through history is just full of uh, um, cases where you felt for sure that a country is going to take off and it doesn't take off. In the 50s, you would read literature on India just after independence, India and South Korea in American writings that India is a sure case of a country that is going to take off. India did not take off. It remained stagnant. It's only from the mid 80s and then 90s things began to change. So a good 30 years, your forecast was wrong. Go back a little bit more than 100 years. There are writings where people are speculating whether Argentina is going to be the big dominant economy in the world or the United States of America. And that was because there was a bit of a toss up and it was entirely possible that Argentina would be there. But that proved completely wrong. The United States took off in a way that was unthinkable. Argentina, despite initial advantages, suddenly began to flatten out. You have to have your eyes open and an element of skepticism, having studied any trend that the trend might not continue. But nevertheless, I think it's very, very likely why it will continue. And let me explain why that is so. The crisis that we have been seeing in the global landscape, um, US subprime crisis, 2007, 2008, Lehman collapse, 2008, sovereign debt crisis in Europe, 2011 peaking, and now also actually um, um, in a very, very precarious situation. These are all at one level separate incidents. But I think underlying these incidents, there is a sign of a tectonic problem going on beneath the surface, which is causing multiple problems to crop up. And the tectonic change is the following. Poorer countries, and I'm over here taking from uh, the very poor countries, sub-Saharan African countries, to middle-income countries, Latin American countries, India and the new middle-income countries, had a lot of resource, resource in terms of skill and labor that was not able to connect up with the global labor markets. Change of technology, no individual caused it, means that this resource, which was like uh, minerals being buried under the ground, are suddenly available in the global space. This is changing the global landscape. This makes for opportunities for emerging economies of a kind that was not there before. And that's why my feeling is that this is a period of turbulence because the tectonic plates are shifting right now, but shifting because there is an advantage moving to the emerging economies of the world. So unless you make dramatic mistakes, what you're beginning to see as trends, and which was shown so beautifully on charts earlier, are trends that are every reason why those trends should continue. But again, with the reminder that the world has known that countries have made big mistakes, and suddenly what was seeming to take off has had setbacks. From China, you can get dramatic examples. China from 1978 has been growing very rapidly, but China had growth rates of over 10% per annum, over 14% per annum right from 1950. There were times when you felt China was taking off. 1958, the great leap forward has been announced. You feel China's now going to really take off. By 1961, China's growth collapses, negative growth by over 20%. So national income shrinks. So lots of things go wrong on the way. But if I have to take a one-sided bet, I would say it's sustainable. Never take a one-sided bet. Latin America <laughs> is no <nosy. laughs> Hedge. 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 Always hedge, hedge please. Hedge. <laughs> OK, the, we have time for questions. Let me invite Augusto and Emil to join the table. And while they do that, um, you know, the questions are for everybody. I think there's a microphone, please. Uh, and if you introduce yourself, OK, I have several questions, but let's start with you. OK, perfect. Hi, my name is Jose Frech. I have a question. Can you introduce yourself, please? Jose Frech, uh, oh, ex yes, from Explorer Advisory. I have actually two questions. Uh, both of them are good, though. <laughs> I, I have one for Mr. Basu. Uh, you were explaining how the middle class helps uh, promote change, you know, in societies. And I actually was wondering if you're willing to, to think about the other side, that actually is bad for a country to have a rising middle class because it becomes a hopeful middle class, namely a middle class that aspires to become a, a wealthy person but never gets there. So instead of being against the status quo, it becomes for the status quo. Therefore, it doesn't go out to the streets to protest uh, for inequality and all these things. It becomes part of the status quo. And, and I, I agree with you that it's good to have envious uh, middle class. And Mr. De La Torre, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a, a great example of that is the president of Ecuador, actually, as a person who, was, who came from middle class, had access to education, but had a bit of resentment. And we've seen how that has worked in his country. 
a general question for the earlier panel. Uh, most of you spoke about people opting out uh, in many countries, about the middle class opting out. And I wanted to know if you've just taken this as an economic factor or if you've considered the social consequences of this, namely that in countries where there's a small wealthy class, the middle class has more access to rub shoulders with the wealthy of their country. So I wanted to know if in these countries with a small wealthy class, where the middle class has more opportunities to rub shoulders with them, there's a greater portion of the middle class opting out because of social pressure. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, basically because they aspire to become wealthy, but if you're seen in a, in a public hospital, it's bad for you, for your aspirations. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to be taking several questions, but I need to read, there are like several questions, so please be brief. Um, I need to recognize Teresa, please. Perhaps it's more a comment. I think that in Brazil, uh, the re um, improvement in the middle class has been largely driven by the behavior of the minimum wage, I mean, by the adjustment in the minimum wage, more so, I would say, uh, than uh, the conditional transfer programs. Minimum wages have been increased in real terms very much faster than productivity growth. My question is, how sustainable is this? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, at the back. Hey, hi, my name is Marco Fernandez from Duke University. I'm a political scientist. So my question is, uh, well, first, uh, it's a question and at the same time uh, a suggestion. I think that um, uh, the report, what it needs is a complementary part that is precisely to analyze the politics that could, uh, that could uh, help to continue uh, moving forward in, in uh, improving the distribution of income. You talk about the importance of education, but uh, and one of the key problems is the quality of, of education. And my question is, how do you create the political coalition to reform the education systems in the region to improve precisely the quality of education that could continue improving, uh, 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 increasing the middle classes and overcoming poverty. And this question is particularly, I think, important when you see that the middle class, according to the polls, uh, it's precisely uh, uh, given that it doesn't use uh, the public education, is not interested in education reform. And on the other hand, the poor are satisfied with the quality of education they receive in the public system. So it doesn't seem to be a constituency that is pushing politicians to improve the quality of education in their systems. Thank you. Uh, we have rules. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, then listen. 20 seconds. Go to the questions or I will have to interrupt. I was, not, I, were, I was not lucky. Yeah, um, Angel Melguiza from the IDB. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Angel Melguiza from the IDB. Given that my vice president couldn't be here, I would say that also uh, middle classes are informal. This is a thing that maybe we haven't been talking about. And they are informal in at least two senses. First, they don't have social protection when they get old, but also they tend to work without a contract without a written contract so and and this is very much related with my with my question uh, we were thinking about how to strengthen the social contract uh, i'm european and i always said okay taxation and which taxation personal income tax progressive personal income tax but when we see the, the data we see that the these personal income tax are actually informal uh, informal yeah very progressive so what should countries do, those countries which, which do don't have commodities, or, I mean, wealth uh, taxation is enough, or, I mean, where to start to, to okay. strengthen the, the social contracts? Uh, let me start with this row. There are three questions in this, or oh, four questions in this row. Um, uh, but, uh, I'll be super brief. Okay, My name is Lina. I work for the IDV at Opportunities for the Majority. We finance business models for the base of the pyramid. And my question is why the opting out trend is a bad thing. I don't see what's bad with it. Isn't it the opportunity to make like a shrink the state and open the opportunity for the private sector to provide high quality services and goods? 
Hi, I'm Sven Witteft, a graduate student at the LE School of International Affairs. I just would like to know what role remittances played in all this in the expert community. Hi, Patty Pettish, a consultant with the World Bank, and I worked on their big moving out of poverty study. And the big factor that everybody will tell you how they climb is jobs. And I'm just hoping you could connect some of the discussion today to the jobs, WBR, and specifically you know, I have a lot of people I interview who say, I can't get a job. Joan Nelson, a political scientist, uh, interested for a long time in the politics of reform, particularly in education and health. Uh, partly a comment, uh, or a couple of comments, uh, great uncertainty as to how to improve institutions. Uh, not, and it's, it's a, a problem that goes, uh, that uh, economists face, but so does everybody else. Um, middle, the concept of a unified middle class as a source of political pressure, I think is highly dubious, extremely heterogeneous uh, social category. And therefore, one needs to start as a research strategy, sort of disaggregating uh, what segments under what conditions press for what kinds of change. Uh, the United States prides itself on being, uh, you know, sort of 110 percent middle class, except for the upper one percent. Uh, <laughs> We've been struggling with education reform uh, and a great deal of the resistance to education reform comes from middle class groups. Thank you. Okay, three, okay. Uh, thank you very much, very, very interesting uh, panel. Very quick point. Um, I think it's not so, so uh, Hernan Rosenberg, I'm an independent consultant and uh, also work in the University of Chile. Um, I don't think it's surprising that there is increase in the middle class from the income point of view and increase in income, mal in income maldistribution. I think that nobody wants anybody to be poor or sick or anything like that as long as, not at, if it, as, long as it is not at my expense. And by the same token and the other point that has been done about improving institutions, institutions are not bad because some moron created it. It fits somebody that the institution doesn't work very well. So I would like the panel to comment on that. In other words, I mean, other than Louis XVI, we know what happened to him for not reforming the institutions. Uh, what other ways are there to get it together? Thank you. Yes, right there. Um. Um, Andrew Reynolds from the Department of State. Uh, one thing I haven't heard discussed, and I don't think it's treated in the report, but I haven't read it, I've just seen your executive summary, is the role of information and communication technologies and the diffusion so rapidly over the last decade, in short, social empowerment through ICTs. The UNCTAD has looked at this extensively, United Nations Commission on Trade and Development in Geneva. And moreover, this is a powerful agent for the individual. It's also powerful for holding institutions accountable and also for improving education. So I wish the panel might address the role of ICTs in sustaining the growth of middle class in Latin America. Thank you. Okay, there's a question right there. Hello, Monica Weeks from the Council of the Americas. Uh, two questions. Do you identify the way that the middle class rose um, as far as jobs are in which sector? And the second one, and perhaps this is for a more political scientist question, but is moving away or uh, brain drain a threat to sustainability for the middle class? Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Y and I'm with Hopkins. I was in Mexico for during the last six months of the elections and my question is, when I was there, a lot, um, there was a huge issue with corruption, usual. And a lot of the people who are included, I would say, in the study would also be included as people who volunteered their vote in, in exchange for some monetary good, to not say they sold their vote. So don't you see an issue with that? Because I would say that those, you want participation, but at the same time, when you have a non-secure, I don't know, I see that as non-secure. Okay, Carlos, the final question. 
Carlos Aramayo, I'm with CGD and Georgetown University. Uh, my question is for Dr. Basu. Specifically, what do you think the World Bank could do or is willing to do in terms of developing this social safety nets that the middle class, well, or this upcoming middle class wants in terms of education, healthcare? I mean, you mentioned, or somebody mentioned tax reform, but that's political kryptonite in some countries. I am Brazilian, I know tax reform in my country has been, I mean, polit politicians have been trying to do it for the past 15 years and we haven't achieved anything yet. Does the World Bank have any willingness to play a role in this? It, it is a new field, I, I think, in my, in my view, that the World Bank could develop. Okay, now um, I have to understand you've been very patient, but you're practically all here, and you already told. So if I see the room, you know, emptying up, then I'll rush the responses. Um, but I'm going to start with my two panelists first and give the last opportunity to uh, the authors uh, next. But please be brief and choose your responses. So, Mark. Well, I mean, uh, I thought you were gonna do the other way around, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I think that, again, we are confusing what the report calls the middle class and what they call it vulnerable. Like, I think the Teresa's point partly applies more what, to what they call the vulnerable group than the middle class, where the minimum wage really is important in determining their, their uh, rising incomes. But I think your, your uh, question is pertinent even if it just focuses on the vulnerable. The middle class's income probably comes from primarily market-driven forces. So uh, I think that, uh, again, that's why we have to be very clear of which, which groups we're, we're, we're talking about. But I let Jamele and Augusto then respond to that. About the question of why, why should we be concerned if uh, the middle class opts out on this from the services? I think because then it becomes, unless it is a strategy by which you're going to generate the change. I mean, what we don't know is what, what generates the dynamics that will create for people to opt in. I think unless they're part of the social contract that benefits from some of the services, the quality of services probably will continue to be very low. So we're in a vicious circle that you want to break. So unless this opting out is a way in which you generate, you know, competition and therefore, you know, the public sector begins to be part of uh, the quality improvement process, I think that it would not create the conditions for a social contract in which you get rid of the inequality of opportunity that's generated by the differences in quality, which is huge. Right now, I think Latin America is moving away from the differences in quantity to the differences in quality. And that's a problem with opting out. That's, you know. Uh, Angel, I think that also the informal sector is more in the vulnerable group, not in the 50 to 100. That's where the pro problem lies. And I think that the main challenge, I mean, you have an informal sector in Latin America. The contributory system doesn't respond to its needs of economic security. So you will have a, to have non-contributory systems helping them. However, the key is that those non-contributory systems should be designed in such a way that they do not reproduce informality over time. And that, I think, would have been Santiago's main point. Right now, we have many non-contributory systems that are plagued with perverse incentives. But it doesn't mean that we cannot design them better. We're going to need them. Yeah, and I want to ask that if Santiago were here, actually the question that was raised about productivity was a question that was designed for him, since he's an expert on that, but we leave that for another time. Uh, Koshik, your thoughts, please. Yeah, let me um, just take uh, four questions to which I have something to say. Very quickly on the first one on ICT, I'm, I'm doing it in no particular order. Uh, just a brief remark that uh, coming from India, I'm just very aware of its critical importance. The Indian takeoff, uh, which happened from the mid-1990s, there were lots of distant causes like the stress on higher education through the 50s, 60s, I think, played a very big role. But it was the ICT sector that caused the takeoff. So it was just critical for this very poor country suddenly to use that as a vehicle. But your question may have also uh, suggested the importance of communication and social movements. 
that in India did not play too big a role simply because that was one side of India which was always very open. Information was flowing, the very, very critical media. But in societies where that is not the case, ICT also has that social and political dimension, of course, to be kept in mind. Angela, a brief remark to what you said. Yes, people um, um, at times sell their votes, but I think people sell their votes less often than most people think. People take the money given to them for the votes and then vote the way they want if it is a properly done anonymous voting. That's why you do get these swings. So luckily, that, that is there. Um, then um, uh, the World Bank and the social safety nets question, I'm taking it on only because it's directed at me. Very important topic for us. But here, I feel the most important role to be played is that the global experience is very different. You get very good conditional cash transfer program in Brazil. You have some other program in Indonesia. World Bank is in a position to take this knowledge across the world from one place to another. And the benefit of this knowledge being taken to the doorstep of where it's needed is huge. And I like to believe that that's the role that the World Bank will play. And finally, I want to take on the question that Jose asked and uh, the political scientist, I didn't catch your name. On are we, are we placing too much uh, hope on the middle class? And indeed, there is a, um, a something to worry about. Middle classes can get co-opted very often. When you're the upper middle class, you get co-opted into being lulled into silence that, look, you're also benefiting from this. So let the system continue. So the protests, there can be situations where you don't get. And if you look at the history of the colonial period, and I'm, again, picking from the area I know best, the British ruled India with a minuscule number of British people on the soil. It was Indians that were providing the ruling, which was the genius of the colonial uh, system, that you use the upper middle classes of that society. And they have so much interest in the system that they don't like to rock uh, that. So that is indeed something that you have to be concerned about, accepting what happens in the long run is that class finally wakes up, I think. And most of this, ultimately, the movements that are colonial movements that overthrow the imperialist forces, they come from the upper echelons of the local society, where that awareness at some point reaches a critical mass. But having said that, that lull can last for a very long time, so one ought to be careful about it. So I take your words as words of caution. Thank you. OK, um, let me give Jessica very short time uh, to the authors of the report. So Jamil first and uh, Augusto. Uh, Thank you, Liliana. I think we got very m good questions. But since the, the panel is answered, I think I, I wanted to comment on two issues that were raised. Uh, one is, uh, why do we care about the middle class if we fight poverty? And, and, and I think one thing that this report highlights, that poverty is not only earning below $2 a day. I mean, as, as Koshik Basu said, there are the poor in Portugal. Poverty is, a, is about being mar marginalized, not being able to function as at other, at other, com other groups in society. So I think we, we, the more we move toward middle income countries, the more we need to care about equity, about ensuring that everybody can function appropriately. And, and, and actually, I think that's actually a a much more difficult fight because while in, in Africa you might have to help the average person with the average abilities, when you move to Latin America you need to help the marginalized people that are not necessarily able to function as well as an average person in Africa. So, so, so I think what this report brings is, is, is the equity angle into, into the poverty discussion. And, uh, and there, it's, uh, I think it relates a bit to the fragmentation of the social contract. Why do we care if the middle class opts out? Because uh, whether it's provided publicly or whether it's provided privately, so social services and public services need to be provided of high quality <laughs> to the poor. And, and that's actually not happening, and that's where we, we really need to, to care. And the second is about the resilience of the middle class, then I'm finished. Uh, I think it's, it's true. Uh, when we look at Argentina, 2003 crisis, uh, middle class halved uh, just because of a macroeconomic crisis. And now, uh, that's why also uh, the Argentina are very happy about our reports, because we start from 2003 measuring the growth of the middle class and say now it's doubled. <laughs> but basically, it's close to the level <laughs> where, where it was before. Uh, but I think what, one thing that we are observing is structural things are improving. People are getting more educated. People are getting better educated. So what, what I really believe, being middle class, is, is being more resilient 
to these shocks. The shock might happen, your hingo might get halved in one crisis, but you catch up faster and I think that is there to stay. Thank you. Well, uh, I have to say these are wonderful questions, difficult questions, and a wonderful uh, panel. I am very thankful about this. So let me just conclude by making some reflections about the, this very interesting topic that uh, uh, some of you put on the table, which is there's this indeterminacy. Having more numbers in the middle class does not necessarily mean anything. It, it, it may mean good things, but it, then again, it may not. And this indeterminacy is part of the nature of social dynamics. You can have a middle class that elects Hitler, and you can have a middle class that is resentful, as is happening now in Ecuador. And so you have a politics of resentment. You have a middle class that's highly populist. So this, I think it's very important to know that these things are indeterminate and that the, the task before us is to understand when and how you change something that's indeterminate and something that moves in certain certain direction. Now, I do believe that there are important, that's I think, I, Hassan was telling me already, this is the next flagship he was saying. <laughs> we need to understand the things that can help move out of bad equilibriums or the things that can help preventing bad equilibriums. We have a very nice, uh, very important intervention that we study in the report, which is student loan programs in Chile. And it is very interesting to see how it do, they do make a difference. So you have kids, poor kids, that come to certain levels of in these SAT tests and things like that. But having access to the student loan creates a equality of opportunity that puts people in the possibility of doing things that otherwise they would not be doing. So there are important interventions that can create equalization of opportunity, give people a chance. My sense is that to the extent that there is this indeterminacy, you can capture the upside if the middle class becomes a group where collective action problems can be solved easy or more easily. You know, you, you read Munker Olson's book, classic view on collective action. The fact that people have a common interest doesn't mean that they will act on behalf of pursuit of the common interest. Now, I, I would think a hypothesis is that the middle class may be more able to work this common interest problem better because of education. They are less likely to be fooled. They are more likely to see interactions. They're more likely to feel that they want to live in a society where merit pays, where effort pays, where where you were born doesn't really determine the future. So I, I, the sense I get is that the reason why we believe the middle class can help is because ultimately we think that some important collective action problems are easily and more easily solved uh, with the middle class. But the middle class has to believe that it lives in a society that's not rigged. Now, in many countries in Latin America, they think it is hopelessly rigged, that no matter what you do, it's going to be connections, it's going to be who you, who you know more than who you are that determines your future. So how to change this perception is very important. But for the first time, at least in my professional life, in 20 years of traveling through Latin America, for the first time, when I talked to a taxi driver and I asked, always I asked the question, do you think your kids are getting better than you were? I get more positive answers <laughs> in, the, in the last years than I used to get in the past. So something is moving there, uh, and, and there is room for leaders, political leaders, to create through, through important actions the perception that people have equal chances. And I think that's where the basic thrust of the policy agenda uh, will have to go to. Well, uh, thank you very much to all of you for attending the panel, and please help me to give a round of applause.